Okay, so now what we're going to talk about is um, we're going to start in on the structural stuff of the heart. So this is chapter um, 28 and 29 in your book, and I'm going to um, I'm going to structure it so that we'll do one lecture on the valve stuff, um, and then we'll talk about some of the um, infections that can occur in the heart and some of the um, like the structural things that can occur just in the muscle part of the heart. And then the second part of the um, this series is going to come out of chapter 29 and that's going to talk mostly about the complications that can occur when your patient is having some kind of um, heart problem like you know like the heart failures and um, pulmonary edema and stuff like that. So let's start on chapter 28, and um, we're going. I'm going to tell you about the um, the valve stuff. So um, these are the words I need you to be familiar with: regurgitation, stenosis, and prolapse. When you hear those words, it's typically referring, usually relating to the mitral and the aortic valve. Now, if you'll recall from anatomy. Right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. The blood comes in from the subclavian jugular veins. It just drops into the right atrium. There's not really a valve there. The reason you have valves is to keep the blood going in one direction. Um, so you've got valves in the veins, but once it gets up into the right atrium, um, it, the blood gets from the right atrium to the ventricles through contraction and gravity. So you don't really, you don't really need a valve up here in the right atrium. So the first valve that that um, shows up in the heart is the tricuspid valve, and it's a three-leafed valve that uh, that is between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So the blood, every time um, the right atriums are contracting, I mean the atri both atrium are contracting, that occurs during. Um, uh, systole, well, diastole, because what's happening when these are contracting. The valve is opening so that the ventricles can fill, that is during diastole, and then during systole, when those ventricles are contracting and ejecting blood, this valve, the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve, shut really tight, so when the force of these ventricles are contracting, the blood can't get back up into the atrium. So this is the tricuspid valve, and the same thing is occurring um, in the pulmonic valve, which is in the right ventricle, and it's going up into the pulmonary system, into the lungs, and then the lungs come back, they dump the blood into the left atrium. Again, there's not really a valve there, that just sort of works on um, gravity. And then between the left atrium and the left ventricle, you've got the mitral valve here. And again, it's a very strong valve because when um, that left ventricle is contracting, this aortic and pulmonic valves open up during during um, systole. The pulmonic and aortic valves are open, so the blood can be ejected um, through here. And then these two valves are closed, so that during systole, it's not going back up into the atrium. That's usually a wonderful system until you start having a problem with one of the valves. You can have a problem with any of the valves, um, but typically it's the mitral and the aortic valves that um, tend to have problems, but these things can occur in any of these valves. And if any of these valves aren't shutting and opening when they're supposed to, uh, you're going to have problems. So the, the tricuspid and mitral valves should be opening and closing at the same time, and the pulmonic and aortic valve should be opening and closing at the same time. Um, and they are exactly the opposite depending on if you're in systole or diastole. So some of the things that can occur is the first thing is regurgitation. This is the most common and what happens in regurgitation is when one of these valves um, and when it's supposed to come back really tight like this it just doesn't. It, it, it's not, it doesn't create like a nice hard tight seal. It's kind of like when your faucet's leaking you turn the faucet off, you turn the valve off you don't expect any more water, but sometimes when you get that dripping water, that's regurge. And so what happens is when these valves aren't sealed tight and they're not shutting tight, 
when these ventricles are contracting, they contract with a lot of force, you get some blood return back up this way. So the blood is supposed to come out here uh, into the aortic valve during systole, but instead, because this is um, ineffective, some of the blood comes back up into the left atrium, or vice versa if it's occurring over here. Um, that is called regurgitation. A stenosed valve is a valve that um, is not very malleable, and you can think of it as like a rusty pipe, like, like the faucet is supposed to open and then close and open and close, but in a stenosed valve, it's really hard. Um, it's not closing tight, and then th like this, there's my little red guy, it's over here. So this that's supposed to come back and be um, closed tight, it just kind of stays open a little bit like this. So it doesn't really open or close very well, it just sort of stays stenosed open. Um, and so then the blood can get back and forth between these two chambers when it's not supposed to. And then the third thing that can occur is um, a situation called prolapse. Now, um, and when I'm in class, I'll show you what this looks like, or just Google an image of um, what a prolapsed valve looks like. All of these valves have like these tendon things on them, like that. They come down kind of like that, that sort of help, um, help keep them in place and help them contract and open. Well, sometimes part of this can prolapse, it can kind of fall down. And so instead of it um, like opening and closing like it's supposed to, one of the flaps has kind of fallen down. It's, it's prolapsed. It's, you know, it's, it's, it fell. So that's called a prolapsed valve. So those are the different kinds of um, things that, that can occur with your valves. Now, here's the problem. This can lead to a variety of um, complications. The, the least of which is, or not the least of which, is the increased risk for clots. Because one thing that these valves do is it keeps the blood flowing in a constant direction, up through here, back through here. Everything is nice and constant, flows back out. Well, when you all of a sudden get um, a valve problem and some of this blood is coming back up in here, like this, you're getting a bunch of churning. Blood doesn't like to be churned. When blood gets churned, it clots. And so these patients um, who have valve problems are high risk for developing clots. Um, so a, a mild valve problem, at minimum, the patient's going to need to be on like a blood thinner. And it could be as small as an aspirin, but they might need to be on some Coumadin therapy because you, you want to prevent the clotting from occurring. You want to keep the blood thin because... Um, it, that's going to be less likely to create um, a clotting situation. You're also going to watch for other signs and symptoms. Um, like, for example, if the, the blood can't get to where it's supposed to go and it starts backing up, if it backs up into the left side of the heart, like, if, like from the left atrium to the left ventricle, if there's a problem in here and it backs up into the pulmonary system, you can have... Um, like heart, it's called heart failure. We'll talk about that um, next time. You can, you'll hear rails and crackles. Your patient will have dyspnea, um, difficulty breathing. If it is occurring over here in the tricuspid or pulmonic valves, a um, little more rare, but you can have um, JVD, increased CVP, that's called, uh, you can start developing right-sided heart failure. Um, Patients who have these um, conditions need to have um, low sodium diets. You don't want them retaining fluids. Um, and then you would monitor the patient for cardiorespiratory um, symptoms. And the other thing that they're going to, you have to be cautious of is how much activity they're doing because if they're up and running and you're, uh, or really active and you're putting a lot more blood through that system, you're going to have uh, worse complications from the um, mitral valve regurg or stenosis or the prolapse. 
they might have trouble sleeping. So when they lay down, some of the situation can get worse because if you're standing up and you have um, an ineffective valve, gravity will help a little bit. But when you're laying back down, you have a lot more pressure and then gravity doesn't work as well to help get some of this blood where it's supposed to be. So a patient might have to start sleeping on pillows, sleeping in a lazy boy, something like that. Pa this um, uh, valve problem can sometimes run in families. So if a family member has a valve problem, other people in that family for blood bloodline relatives are at higher risk for developing valve problems, these patients absolutely should be taught to not smoke. Smoking, as you already know by now, makes everything worse, causes vasoconstriction, causes um, lung problems. So obviously, if we can get them to stop smoking, that would be great. They should not um, drink alcohol. Um, low sodium diets, like I already said, be very careful with how much activity that patient is engaging in. Um, the other thing that you have to watch for in your patient who has a valve problem because they are also at higher risk for developing um, endocarditis or infection on those valves or on the inside lining of the heart. So anybody who has a valve problem needs to be treated prophylactically um, if they're in a high risk situation. And this is like anytime you go to the dentist because your gums are very vascular and your mouth has a lot of bacteria in it. And so after you go to the dentist, you are at higher risk for developing an infection because they're stirring up the bacteria next to the bloodstream. And if that gets into the heart, that can lead to um, infective endocarditis. Um, or vegetative valves on the heart. So you have to be, you've got to teach that patient to um, have prophylactic antibiotics before they go to the dentist. Um, so then, so we found out that our patient now has a valve problem. Um, and this is diagnosed, one with symptoms, and then you'll get an ultrasound and, and get the cardiologist involved. And, figure out exactly what's wrong with the valve, if it's a regurg or stenosis or prolapse. And then there's a couple different options that you can do for your patient who has a valve problem. And it's, both of them are, um, it, not all of them are surgical, but they're all invasive. So some of them are the plasties, like you can have a balloonoplasty, a valvoplasty, and basically what that is, um, like, like with the, balloon one, they will go into, I've kind of made a little mess of my thing here. Let me redraw this. Okay, so this this is my mitral valve and it's not working. Let's let's say that it's stenosed. I've got a stenosed valve. So so this valve is basically rusted open. That that's what it's like. So if you go in and do or if the cardiologist goes in and does a uh, some kind of plasty, a valvuloplasty. They go in with a um, like a catheter, and then there's a balloon on it, and so they get the catheter through this stenosed valve, and they blow open this balloon. And basically, what it does is kind of like putting oil on a rusty pipe. So it just kind of this this thing that's all stenosed. They just kind of um, blast it open and it makes it more mobile again. So, and those are less invasive than surgical procedures. So oftentimes they will try on a stenosed valve, they will try to do some of the, you know, valvuloplasties or balloonoplasties. And I think your book does a pretty good job um, about describing that. Now, if it's a prolapsed, um, valve and it's some of these these tendons that I was telling you about that hold them up some of these are problematic they can go in and re and just repair that um, sometimes there's there's another procedure where they can sort of um, like if it's um, prolapsed or regurgitating they can pull it up and kind of and then sort of suture it in like that um, and, and usually they'll try to do those less invasive procedures to repair some of these before they have to go into a complete valve replacement. But if those aren't working or the situation is um, significant enough and the patient's having enough um, side effects or symptoms, then they'll go in and actually do a valve replacement. There's a lot of different kinds of valves on the market. 
um, they used to pretty much all do pig um, valves because um, pigs heart valves are most similar to um, human heart valves so they would do um, uh, bovine replacements and then they just have a, a pig valve in your heart well now sometimes some places still use that um, there are a lot of other mechanical and synthetic kinds of valves too I think your book I'm not I can't remember if your book talks or shows you about that or not I'll I'll look um, I'll look and see but there's like a um there are some synthetic valves that actually look and operate like the um, tricuspid or mitral valves there are other valves that are sort of like a um, like a ball in a cage so like the cage is like this there's a little ball in it and it kind of goes it kind of goes like um, so like here's the ball and when the when the blood is flowing this way there's enough room let me make the let me make this better so here's the ball and when the and the blood is coming down like this this is sort of angled like that there's enough um, room for all the blood to go through but then when the ventricle contracts and goes and pushes up against it the ball lodges up in here so none of the blood can get get through that's called a, a ball and cage model um, so there's a couple different kinds of valves and they go in and they basically just take the old valve out and put in whatever whatever the cardiologist likes and is best for the patient that's what they'll put in for a valve replacement if you're listening to somebody's chest that has a valve replacement it sounds very different than um, an actual heart it's it's very mechanical sounding it's got much more of like a, a click to it so you do need to be aware if you're listening to somebody and they've had a valve replacement once a patient has had um, a valve replacement it's very similar to um, the treatment for a regular valve problem they need to stay on anticoagulants they need to stay on blood thinners they need to be treated before surgical procedures um, you need to be very careful post-operatively you treat them um, as if they've had a cardiac catheterization you, you have you you monitor them for um, blood clots anytime you start messing with these valves in the heart the patient is at higher risk for blood clots so you monitor that um, especially like if if it's um, done here in the mitral valve if if the clots develop you're gonna you're gonna watch for things like stroke because if it goes up to the um, head if that clot goes up into the carotid arteries in the head you're gonna have a stroke um, it could come back around to the um, coronary arteries that's less likely but you can have an MI it could go down to the renal arteries you have reduced um, urinary output so you monitor for things like that if it's over on the in the tricuspid valve then you're going to start watching for signs and symptoms more like a PE the clot would then go to the lungs and then the patient's going to have trouble breathing and dyspnea and stuff so it really matters which valve has been repaired or replaced um, and monitoring for what kinds of symptoms um, echocardiograms are done um, before and after these procedures and anybody who's had a valve replacement has to have routine echocardiograms to make sure that everything is functioning the blood is going in the areas that it's supposed to go into um, okay so that's it with valve stuff so that's half of chapter 28 then I'm going to stop it here and then we're going to go into some of the cardiomyopathies um, and what can happen to the actual outside structure of the heart so that's it for valves. Easy, right?